we're looking at the life we're looking at the life of Elijah and uh, how the God ministers to him and what uh, the life of Elijah shows us as people who live today. Uh, we'll begin in verse 1 of chapter 18 of First Kings. This is God's word eternally true. After a long time in the third year, the word of the Lord came to Elijah, go and present yourself to Ahab and I will send rain on the land. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in the Samaria and Ahab, Ahab had summoned Obadiah who was in charge of his palace. Obadiah was a devout believer in the Lord. While Jezebel was killing off the Lord's prophets, Obadiah had taken a hundred prophets and hidden them in two caves, 50 in each, and had supplied them with food and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, go through the land to all the springs and valleys. Maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive so we will not have, have to kill any of our animals. So they divided the land they were to cover, Ahab going in one direction and Obadiah in another. As Obadiah was walking along, Elijah met him. Obadiah recognized him, bowed to the ground and said, Is it really you, my lord, Elijah? Yes, he replied. Go and tell your master, Elijah is here. What have I done wrong, asked Obadiah, that you are handing your servant over to Ahab to be put to death? As surely as the Lord your God lives, there is not a nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to look for you. And whenever a nation or kingdom claimed you were not there, he made them swear they could not find you. But now you tell me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. I don't know where the spirit of the Lord may carry you when I leave you. If I go and tell Ahab and he doesn't find you, he will kill me. Yet I, your servant, have worshipped the Lord since my youth. Haven't you heard, my Lord, what I did while Jezebel was killing the prophets of the Lord? I hid a hundred of the Lord's prophets in two caves, fifty in each, and supplied them with food and water. And now you're telling me to go to my master and say, Elijah is here. He will kill me. Elijah said, As the Lord, all God, Lord Almighty lives, whom I serve, I will surely present myself to Ahab today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. Here ends our reading. Uh, there's a response of thankfulness printed for you uh, in your bulletin or up here. Uh, the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks indeed. Let's pray. Our God and Father, we are grateful, thankful to you for this, your word. Uh, these words were inspired by your spirit. You gave them to us and have given them to your people from the day they, have, they were written and today's until Jesus, you return. Uh, we pray that you would work in us, that you would grant us understanding uh, by your spirit, uh, that we would uh, understand more about you, understand more about ourselves and understand how we are to live. Help us to see Father, your son, Jesus. Help us to understand his gospel uh, more and more as you preach to us, Jesus, uh, by your spirit. We pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, some of you know I like to run. Um, I like to run for a number of reasons, uh, but one of the big ones is that uh, it's a, a little... Um, uh, Uh, example uh, of life um, running each time um, it's easier to stay inside and eat pork rinds that's what I'd prefer to do um, but but I don't um, but running uh, distance running in particular uh, what I like about it is the the parallel it is to life um, it requires steady patient endurance uh, just keeping on going uh, when it's not easy, and, and that's something that I get taught um, each time I'm each time I'm out. Um, it involves staying calm and keeping on, keeping breathing, not panicking, uh, saying I will be okay. Um, just keeping 
one leg moving in front of the other time after time. That's the Christian life. Um, life between the advents of Jesus, his first advent being what we call Christmas, and his second advent being his, his return. Um, life is not easy. And that's what we've been talking about the last few weeks. That's what we see here for Elijah and Obadiah and the 100 prophets. Um, life during our day, life on earth is, is not easy. Um, and Jesus made sure to tell his disciples this before he left. Uh, a lot of what he's saying as he gathers with his disciples the night before his death is preparing them for the fact that their lives will not be easy even though he will have gone to heaven and will be seated at the right hand of his father reigning over the church. Uh, that could be a, an assumption that we could make if, if we know what's true, that Jesus is at the right hand of his father and, and reigning over all things and that he's all powerful. We might assume that no trouble ever comes to us and no endurance is required. Uh, Jesus made sure to tell Paul, Saul of Tarsus this when he converted Saul on the, the road to Damascus. Uh, he uh, says, Paul, go to, or Saul, go to Damascus and go to a man named Ananias. And then uh, Jesus speaks to Ananias and, and says to Ananias, I will show him how much he must suffer for my sake. Um, our lives here on earth are, are not um, lives of um, you know, zippity doo da, uh, zippity day, my oh my, what a wonderful day. Um, plenty of sunshine heading my way, zippity doo da, zippity day, right? It's not that way. Um, not everything's going our way. Most things, most things are not. Um, the New Testament's full of teaching telling you and me that persecution and suffering for our faith is part of the package just like finishing a race or a morning run, um, that includes suffering. Uh, but the finishing is the reward. Um, you finish, and you're done, and you've done it. And that's the message for us here in this text this morning. Um, life is suffering, but the reward is in finishing the race. Um, uh, Ohio State's longtime football coach. He was there when my father and mother were there and, until uh, um, 1978. Um, said, nothing is, uh, anything that's easy is not worth a darn. Uh, and, and, and we know that with different things that we accomplish. If it's been hard, difficult to accomplish it, there's great reward when it's accomplished. Uh, but if it's easy, it doesn't matter that much. Uh, but uh, this passage is one that talks about uh, a race that uh, Paul talks about, a race of faith and a great reward uh, for every church person who finishes the race of faith with a life of patient endurance and being faithful to Jesus. So if you'd like to fill out blanks in an outline, here we go. Um, last week we talked about from this passage that, that uh, life is full of tribulation. And that the New Testament uses that term tribulation not just to speak of a bad um, scheme of the end times that sometimes you hear on Christian radio or that you hear televangelists speaking where there's going to be a great tribulation in the end. Uh, this is something that we see for God's people. And that same word tribulation being used for uh, what Jesus goes through and for what the disciples are going through, what people in the first century were going through as Christians and what we go through today. So, in tribulation, number one, uh, God answers the question for us. And here's the question, number one, what's tribulation mean for you and for all Christians? What does it mean? How are we to respond for, uh, to it? Uh, what's it like? Um, A, first thing, means for you, is that just like Jesus, in your life, just like Jesus, you will not receive many pats on the back for being faithful to God. You'll not receive many pats on the back from the world. Uh, Paul says this at the end of his life, right before he's dying in 2 Timothy. He tells his young disciple, Timothy, who's pastoring 
the church probably in Ephesus, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, 2 Timothy 3.12, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Um, Jesus told us in in, uh, Matthew 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, as he he finishes out the Beatitudes, uh, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name. For so the prophets were persecuted before me. Uh, we see this prophet persecution going on by God's own people uh, here in this, in this passage with Elijah, Obadiah, and the hundred. Uh, but we saw too, Jim read it for us, John 15. Here's what Jesus says. This is uh, Lord's Supper time, Last Supper time. Jesus is talking to his disciples, his last words to them before he dies. John 15, 18. He explains... Their lives of tribulation that are coming and why that will be. He says, if the world hates you, and if is in sarcastic quotes there, if the world hates you, it will. And you'll find this out, Jesus says, I've told you this. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. The world hates Jesus. Now, they like the Jesus they create in their own image, the Jesus of, of wicker baskets and daisies skipping through the meadow, saying, blessed be everybody. See you all in heaven. Uh, but they don't like the Jesus of Scripture. They don't like the Jesus who is king, who authoritatively tells them to be obedient to him and to live their lives for his glory. They don't like that Jesus who interrupts their life <laughs> we, you know, sometimes we have people who come in the church for, you know, a month and then they figure out, oh, this talk about repenting, that's for me too. I don't like that. You mean you're asking me to change? I just want you to tell me to tell all those people I don't like out there to change. But don't tell me to change. Don't tell me to be more like Jesus or how dare you tell me that I'm not like Jesus. Because I've created Jesus in my own image. He's basically like me. And if somebody's not like me, they're not like Jesus, so to hell with them. All right? That's literal and figurative. Um, The world hates you. Keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, keep this in mind as believers. If you belong to the world, the world would love you as its own. It would pat you on the back. I mentioned to you last week, it's, you know, the guys throwing up with, you know, because they had uh, drank too much, uh, you know, on Friday or Saturday night. They were getting pat, literally pats on the back. Yo. Um, they loved those who emphasized this is OK to do. Um, if, the, if you belong to the world, it would love you as your own. As it is, you do not belong to the world but I've chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. See, if was in sarcastic quotes. (laughs) He he gives it up at the end. That is why the world hates you. Um, So realize this. um, To encourage your souls when the world hates you, when you're enduring tribulation for your faith, um, that Jesus knows what it's like. You're walking in Jesus' shoes. Um, this is not something Jesus didn't go through. Um, so a couple of things from that. B, this means that the church is important for you. The church is important for you because the world hates you. So the world's not your source of comfort. The world's not your source of encouragement. The world hates you. So the church is important for you because the church is the place of the other people who do not belong to the world but have been chosen out of the world, as Jesus said in John 15. These are the people who don't hate you, who give you pats on the back for following Jesus and owning him and giving him worship. So the church is important for you. Matthew 16, 18, it's the one thing Jesus says he will build. Jesus doesn't say, and I will build the world and make it a better place. If your hopes are in that, again, we're in election season, don't put your hopes in that. It's not going to happen. Vote for those who will vote for righteous things. Vote for those who are righteous. Yes, yes, yes. We want them to do good things and and enable us to live in a land where there are good laws. Uh, But don't put your hopes in that. Um, 
We live in a kingdom of people been brought out of the world and Jesus is not building the world. He says to Peter, you know, on this confession, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, that's where Satan comes out of, hell, that's his home base, hell. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. The gates of hell prevail against the world. Jesus calls that, that which is not the church the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of darkness. So that, that, that which is outside, Jesus is not building. Jesus is not building the world. Jesus is building the church. So that gives us a clue that the church is important. But also Ephesians 5.25, we know it's the thing Jesus loves and nourishes and cherishes as his wife. The thing Jesus died for is the church. So, number one, the church is important for us, not just because it's important to Jesus. That's Matthew 16 and Ephesians 5, 25. Jesus is building the church. He died for the church. But uh, for us, the church is important It's because we, that's where we can get encouragement in the midst of a world lined up against the church. It's where we can get encouragement in the midst of a world lined up against the church. Um, and so as Babylon was and as Rome was in the first century against the church, um, the writer of Hebrews during the first century in our call to worship, and you can look at it there, Hebrews 10.25, your call to worship. writer of Hebrews says, and he's writing probably to the church in Rome. He's uh, writing during a period of, of persecution by the emperor Nero, the Caesar of the time, who's persecuting Christians specifically. And he says this, here's his advice for them. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Oh, I'm just a Christ follower, but I don't like the church. Crap. It's a bunch of crap. Christians need the church, and, and, and that's a terrible thing. We don't survive well when we cut ourselves off the vine. What do we expect but to dry up or, or to get weird in our theology, right? To sit in our basement and have our own worship service, right? Um, but the writer of Hebrews says, don't do that. Say nothing new under the sun. They were doing it in the first century. They were doing it in AD 66 or wherever, whenever this was written. He says, do not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day, that's final judgment, as you see the day approaching. And so Jesus told us the day is approaching and we will have no signs as to when that is. It'll be like a thief in the night. If that sounds funny to you, come to Sunday school in the morning. We're talking about that right now. Um, but um, you don't have to. That's not a command from the Lord. But we are teaching that right now. Um, but uh, as you see the day approaching, you're going to be in tribulation. That's what Jesus said. We saw it last week, John 16, 33. In the world, you'll have troubles, tribulation. But take courage. I've overcome the world. And we come to this place and we learn Jesus has overcome the world. He has been seated at the right hand of God. He is overall rule and authority for the sake of the church. He's letting all the non-church go their own way. He's tempering their behavior a little bit. So things are bad in the world, but he's protecting each and, and each and every one of his people. And so we learn that we're encouraged in that. So we come to the church. The church is important to us because it's where we get encouragement in the midst of a world lined up against us. Now, number two, another aspect of this is, is we are to be an encourager in the church. You be an encourager in the church because all in the church need it. All in the church need it. Obadiah was that for these hundred prophets. He was an active encourager for those who were faithful in northern Israel. Northern Israel, where he is, where Ahab was king and Jezebel was, was queen, this was not a place of faithfulness. 
This was a place from top down. The king had set up calf idols at the, at the southern part of the, the nation in Bethel and, and in the northern uh, part, way up in the north in Dan. He had set up calf idols, Jeroboam had, and the nation was in Baal wor worship. Jezebel was from Sidon. Their god was Baal, and she brought in Baal worship even greater than before. And so the prophets of God were in this place of encouragement because Obadiah was doing that for them. And we're to be like Obadiah to see how people need encouraged, how they need to be nourished or protected uh, during this time. And so we look around at each other and we don't come to the church to extract from us, to learn something, to get a new message today. That's fine. That's part of it. But we don't come self-centered. The heart of our ethic as believers is that we're about other people and about God first. And the reason we're about other people is because other people bear God's image. So we treat them well and we encourage them and we help them along in faith. You ever seen that uh, video of the o Olympic runner from, I think he's from Great Britain, and, and he's, he pulls his hamstring. I think he's running the 400. It's a fairly fast race. And he pulls his hamstring in the, in the final and, and he's, on, he's on the track and he's, he's, he can't get up. Because, you know, if you pull your hamstring, you can't, you can't do anything. And his dad jumps out of the stands <laughs> and comes next to him and puts his son next to him on his shoulder and he helps his, his son limp through to the finish line so he could finish the Olympic race. This is a picture for us as Christians. We come in here and we don't say, oh, where's my bolt and all this kind of stuff. Sure, take care of that stuff. We look around and say, is there anybody new? that I can greet. You guys do a great job with that. Is there anyone here that just kind of looks a little off or, or bomb struck today? Um, anybody who looks like they need a little encouragement? Um, and, and, and we gravitate toward those people to, to help them and, to, uh, and not to say everything's great, but to, but to hear them in, in, in their misery and, and to, in, in life and to, to sit with them. We seek to be encouragers. Um, because that's that's who we are. Uh, the world is how does think how does this work out for me? Will this be to my benefit? But as Christians, it's the other way around. It's like, can I help for somebody else's benefit to love this person? If you're at uh, Allison and you know uh, um, Andrew's wedding here, it's it's you know First Corinthians thirteen. It defines love as being out for somebody else's well being not as an emotion, being out for somebody else's well-being. How can I be patient and kind? How can I assume the best of this person? Um, these kind of things. So be an encourager in the church. And, and we've got that here. And I'm just saying to you, keep that up and, and just know that that's, you know, should, that's in the forefront of your mind and, and, that's the way it should, and that's the way it should be. Be an Obadiah in this passage. Uh, seeking to, to gather those who are beaten up and scared right now, uh, providing for them food and water when there's a drought going on and people don't have food and water. Okay, number two, number two. Um, God says to you this morning, though for being a Christian, you suffer as Jesus did, though it's the case that as being a Christian, you suffer as Jesus did, you still shouldn't, you still shouldn't join back in to the kingdom of the world. And, and this may be a duh coming from a pastor, uh, but, but that's what's before us here in this passage. If you're going, if your life is threatened um, for your faith, it's still not worth it to give up your faith. That's what we're saying here. Um, we shouldn't go back in to the kingdom of the world even though we suffer, especially for being Christians. Um, God will show us how much we must suffer for his sake, as he says of Paul. Um, there's the kingdom of the world and the kingdom of God. Uh, that's Colossians 1.13. Um, Revelation 11.15 maps those things out for us. Two kingdoms, and everybody in the, on the earth is part of one or the other. Everyone on the earth has their citizenship in the world or is a citizen of heaven, Philippians 3.20. Okay. 
Okay? And so we don't want we don't want to come into the church and, and act like we're a citizen of heaven for a while and then head back out. Um, Obadiah and the hundred prophets, Elijah, they're part of the kingdom of God eternal. They had true saving faith. But uh, Ahab and Jezebel and most of Israel had turned back to be part of the kingdom of the world, acting just like the kingdom of the world. They're acting like the Sidonians. They're acting like the people of Canaan that they had conquered kind of incompletely. And so they start worshiping uh, idol gods like they had seen in, in Egypt. They were called out, but they don't combine that being called out with true saving faith, like the Israelites in the desert who die there. Um, and so we don't want to act like Ahab and Jezebel, who were called out of the world to be God's people. These were Israelites, Ahab, or Ahab was at least, and then head back uh, into the world and be like everybody else. But Elijah, Obadiah, and the hundred prophets, um, they don't go back. Uh, Jim read for us from Mark chapter 4, uh, Jesus' parable of the soils. And in that parable, we see Jesus training his disciples what they would, what they would experience when they went out and planted churches. Um, you'll pr proclaim the gospel, you guys, he says to them. You'll proclaim the gospel, and that gospel is, is like a seed. And you'll throw that seed on everybody. And, and some, some of that seed will land on a hard path, and so it'll never germinate. And that's, that's those people who, when you proclaim the gospel, they say, oh, you're crazy, and they just walk away. But then he says there are three kinds of people who will come into the church. The last kind of person is good soil, and you throw that gospel seed on that person, and you find out that's good soil because eventually that person produces fruit, 30, 60, and 100 fold. That's the fruit of the Spirit because the Spirit of God is in that person growing fruit. But he warns them. Just because people come into the church doesn't mean they have saving faith. There are two kinds of people who will come into the church and enjoy it for a while and look like believers in Jesus, and then they'll leave. And there are two categories that bring people into the church and out of the church, and those two people are rocky and thorny soil. Thorny soil is when people get interested in other things, um, whether it's travel sports or 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 uh, working on Sundays instead, uh, instead of uh, being committed to the church, um, whatever it is that, or they, they get interested in other things, or maybe they just get bored of what they heard in the church, and so they head out. Yeah, I was into that for a while, but not anymore. That's thorny soil, never produces fruit. Uh, but then there's also this rocky soil, and rocky soil, and it's the part Jim, Jim read for us. It's those who experience persecution. And because of the persecution, when persecution comes, they leave. They also never produce fruit because the spirit was not present in them. They came in for whatever reason. They had a friend who invited them. It was nice. People were kind to them. It was kind of neat learning about God. The image of God within them was turned on when they came in. They thought they know when they come into the church, this is right and I should be here. And so non-believers feel good about being in the church. Like I, as a kid in my, my theologically liberal church, I felt I didn't want to go to church. I wanted to watch SNL and my parents just to bag it, which we did a lot of times. Um, and, but, but when I went, I knew I should be there. In my soul, I wasn't a believer, but I knew I should be there. I knew this was, this was right. Uh, but um, some people come in for you know different reasons like that. But then they, they head out, especially if persecution comes. You know, so someone might come into the church today. They get made fun of for coming to the church, for being a Christian. And they say, this is just not worth it. Because they don't understand forgiveness. of They're blind. They don't understand forgiveness of sins, eternal life. They hear the words, but the words don't mean anything to them. They haven't connected with their souls because the Spirit of God has not been active. Um, so there are some people that go back, and that's Ahab. That's most of northern Israel. Uh, those are thorny and rocky soil people in, in the northern, northern Israel kingdom. Uh, but Jesus doesn't go back when he suffers. 
for being a true uh, uh, testifier of, of the faith when he says, I am the Son of God, I am the Anointed One, I am the Appointed King, and there's no salvation but through me. I'm the way and the truth and the life. Uh, you can destroy this temple and I will rebuild it in three days. I'm not going back on those things. And Jesus proclaims those things in front of the, the Jewish ruling council. And he proclaims those things in front of Pilate and in front of Herod, knowing that proclaiming that will bring him further suffering, being whipped and such, being mocked, and it will mean his death. But Jesus continues on. Um, and, we're, and we're to do the same. Um, listen to 1 Peter 2.19. For it is commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering. This is Peter talking to Christians. He says, I know you guys are suffering. He says, it's commendable if a man bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because he is conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? <laughs> so continue to do what's right. But if you suffer for doing good and endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called, because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps of continuing to be faithful to the Father and getting beaten for it. He committed no sin. Jesus did not. No deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. So when we're faithful like Jesus, Jesus says, go figure, you're going to suffer too. Um, if they hated me, they'll hate you. If they make me suffer, they'll make you suffer too. Uh, but follow Jesus. That's what Peter says. He's an example for us in being faithful through suffering and not being like the world, even if it costs us our lives. Now, a few things to know. A. A, a few things to know. Know that because Jesus suffered for his faithfulness on earth, that he sympathizes with you and you do the same. Know that because Jesus went all through this, suffering for doing what's right, suffering for giving a faithful witness of who God is and who he was, that when you give a faithful witness of who God is and who Jesus was and is, that you will suffer for it, but Jesus sympathizes with you because he knows what that's like. Listen to Hebrews 4.15. It's our declaration of the gospel. You can turn to it there on the front page. Hebrews 4.15. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. So know that when you suffer, You've got a great comforter in Jesus because he's been there. He knows what that's like to suffer in that way. Second thing to know, B, the temptation of Satan, the temptation of Satan, this is B, the temptation of Satan is that it will be better. It will be better to walk in rebellion against God. That's always the bottom line of whatever you're tempted to do that you know is wrong. That's the temptation of Satan saying, if you do this thing that's rebellion against God, that's rebellion against his commands, that's rebellion against he, who he said you should be. If you do this thing, it will be better for you. That's always the temptation of Satan. And we saw that in the Garden of Eden, didn't we? Jim read that for us from Genesis 3. You know, surely you won't die. You know, and he and Eve, Satan and Eve go back and forth. Well, God said we would die if we ate of this tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he says, you will not die. He just keeps saying it over and over. And then he says, things will be better for you if you disobey God and follow me instead. See, if you eat this, you'll know good and evil and you'll be like a God. It'll be better for you if you eat this. See, he's reasoning with Eve. He's saying, if you follow me, it'll be better for you than if you follow God. And that's temptation. Whenever it comes, whatever's tempting you, that's always what's going on. Satan is saying, it will be better if you follow this other course. It will be better if you let your mouth fly and you tell this person what you think of them. 
then you'll be relieved and you'll feel better. Right, Jim? <laughs> and, and you know if you've done that, that that's a lie. Because as, you, as soon as you say it, you say, uh-oh. <laughs> or you say, oh, man. Or you feel guilty. You know, I, I know different times where I've done this or where I've finally let my mouth fly where I wanted to make fun of somebody before and then I do and then it comes out of my mouth and I realize I've just been cruel and even other people around me say John why'd you say that about Randy <laughs> <laughs> no but I have specific instances in my life where I did that you know it's, it's always a lie but I felt like if I say that That'll be fun and funny and it'll relieve my soul and everybody will laugh. And instead, people said, John, dude, that's mean. Uh, but that's, you know, and that's, that's the trick of Satan always. He knew it would not be better for them. And it wasn't. So that's why we read all that, that cursing. So, you know, those of you who have, have given birth, you know, thank you, Eve, on that one. You know, those of you who have tried to grow, gra grow grass in North Carolina, thank you, Adam, for that curse, uh, dealing with the rocks and the clay and, and the sand or whichever you have or both. I've got four times four types of grass in my yard. Um, <laughs> none of it grows really well. Um, but, but that's always the trick. Um, temptation of Satan is always, it'll be better for you if you rebel against God. And it's not. Um, Satan is your enemy. 1 Peter 5, 8, he's a lion roaring, seeking someone to devour. So resist him and be firm in your faith, is what Peter says. In the midst of your suffering, resist Satan. When he offers you something, he's trying to devour you. He's acting like he's not trying to devour you. He's acting like your friend. He's acting like if you do this, it'll be really great for you. But he's trying to devour you, and he's just hiding that from you so resist him firm in your faith um, see uh, realize this instead God provides for you God provides for you and Satan steals from you God is always wanting to provide for you to show how great an, an abundant provider he is for you in the meanwhile Satan is trying to steal from you so verse 4, those faithful in the Lord in this passage, these hundred prophets, everyone else is thirsty and hungry. And who in this instance in, in chapter 18 here and chapter 17 that we've looked at before, who's getting water? Who's getting food? It's those who are faithful. God supernaturally provides for. And so these prophets, they could have chucked their faith and been safe before Jezebel, who was specifically seeking their lives to kill them. Instead, they remain true, and they end up with the food and water. God provides for them. That's verse, that's verse 4. Um, 17, 6, um, you know, the contrast, uh, the contrast with this, is that we see, well, 17.6, Elijah is provided for at the brook. He's given water. Um, it, it, the contrast to this is chapter 16, verses 31 and 32. Um, Jezebel from Sidon, which is not Israeli territory, not Israeli people, not Jews, um, not God's people, she brings in her God from Sidon, Baal. And Baal was the rain god. That was his thing. Baal was the God who brought rain, right? Do you see the irony here? So she brings in Baal. She brings in Baal worship. They up their Baal worship in northern Israel. And God says, okay, let's do this. And he has Elijah, his prophet, known to be a prophet of the Lord, a prophet of Yahweh, a Lord in all caps, goes, goes to Ahab and says, okay, you think you're going to get more rain by upping the Baal worship? The, 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 God, the God of rain, no rain until I give the word. So realize this in temptation. The world is telling you, Satan is telling you, I will provide for you if you just abandon your faith. If you're not true to your faith, if you're not adherent to God's commands for you, that things will be better for you. Just do a little Baal worship here. Hedge your bets. 
But those who are doing that, rain is stolen from them. Had they just remained neutral, there probably wouldn't be a drought. Right? The prophets would be speaking, but probably not a drought. But because they go to a rain god, God says, I'm going to show you this God doesn't exist. And if you still think he exists, I'm going to show you I wipe him out. 79 to nothing is the score on this. <laughs> um, and, and so God, God doesn't provide for. You end up starving if you follow the rain God. You have no water provided for you. God provides water. So if you're a believer, Peter says to Jesus, we've, we've left everything to follow you. That was the case for these hundred prophets. That was the case for Elijah and for Obadiah. Um, they, were, they were on the run, so to speak. We've left everything to follow you, Peter says to Jesus. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. No one who has left home or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or fields for me and for the gospel will fail to receive a hundred times as much in this present age. Homes, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, and fields, and with them persecutions. <laughs> Um, this is all, that's not me, that's Jesus saying, homes, brothers, this, in this, and in the age to come, eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last first. Um, guess what? You know, if you're a Jew in the first century and you follow Jesus, you may lose your mother and your father. You may lose your brother and your sister. They may not talk to you anymore because you've left the faith. If you're Jewish today and you come to faith in Jesus, you may lose, you may get disowned. Okay, that can happen to you in a Catholic environment as well. Um, if you're in a Muslim country, that will happen to you. Uh, you may lose your life, uh, but your, your dad will disown you if he's a faithful Muslim. Um, but Jesus says, but guess what? You gain brothers and sisters wherever you go. You know, and so here, you know, anyone have, we have about 50 of us, anyone have 50 brothers or sisters that you grew up with in your house? Um, no. No. Um, We've gained, we're richer, aren't we? Because we sit here. Um, you know, even my daughters with four, you know, with four others, they're richer because they sit here. They have brothers, and, 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 and which they didn't before. <laughs> now they kind of do. You're kind of a brother. Um, but, but, but they gain. There's all, this, there's all this wealth. We've got a bigger family, all these people to encourage us, a bigger uh, set of, of giftings, to help us out. So when I need my carpentry help, I call Matt. And uh, I, I'm still, it's, it's, I, I need to call Randy now when I have auto things. I used to call Alan, uh, you know, and find out all these things. We've got this, this whole pool of wealth that we're, that we're pulling from um, because we've got brothers and, and, and lands. You know, if, if somebody needs, you know, if I need to have a picnic somewhere, maybe I've got a brother who's got a big yard and, and he lets me have him. Uh, it lets me have that. In contrast to this, the wealth we get from becoming a Christian. In contrast to this, John 10, 10, Jesus says, the thief, Satan, comes to steal and to kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. So remember this when you're tempted. Satan is trying to steal from you. He's trying to steal blessing from you. He's trying to steal peace in your heart. He's trying to steal from you just walking in love of the Lord and, and knowing you're in the Lord's blessing. He's trying to steal from you assurance that, you'll be, that you won't be disciplined because you're, you're walking with him. Uh, he's trying to steal that from you, so remember that. And Jesus is, has come that you might have life to the full with persecutions. <laughs> in the midst of your persecutions, that your heart, that your soul might be full and happy walking with him okay and d something else to realize with this while satan seeks your harm god will protect you while satan seeks your harm god will protect you so so c was god provides for you d is god will protect you so we see this protection in verse 1 and 5 and 10 and 16 um, that that god is pro providing for his people um, those who are faithful to him, they're being provided for uh, bread and water. They're being protected. They're in this cave. And even though Obadiah has separated them into two caves, just in case 
Ahab finds one, only 50 of them that will be wiped out. God, in fact, protects all 100. And so know that in your life. Jesus is reigning. He has sat down at the right hand of God. And he is, Ephesians 1.23, at the right hand of God, above all rule and authority and, and power, ruling for the sake of the church. He's over you. His, his, your life is in his hands. He, as David said uh, in, in Psalm 139.5, he, he hems me in. He's placed his hand behind me, before me. He's placed his hand upon me. And there's no place we can go. We're not, we're not in his presence. So Satan seeks your harm, but God will protect you. And we see here in this language that it's this three and a half years. Verse one here, it's in the third year, which in Hebrew accounting of years, that means a th a three years have com been completed and it's still not to the fourth year. We find out in James 5, 17 that it's, it was actually three and a half years before it started raining again. So this is this tribulation time, three and a half years. It's a, it's a stock time figure that we see throughout scripture. Three and a half years, like we talked about last, last week, 1200, which is equals 1260 days, 42 months, three and a half years, time, times, and half a time. Okay, all this, all the same thing. And this is tribulation. And God protects us in the midst of tribulation, which Jesus said that we have in this world. In contrast, Ahab is unprotected from foreign armies. This is his concern when he, uh, when he uh, gets Obadiah, whom he doesn't know is hiding these prophets. And he says, Obadiah, you and I, I can trust you, Obadiah. <laughs> See, God's protecting Obadiah and not revealing that he's protecting these prophets. So Ahab comes to him. Obadiah is like his right-hand man. And he comes to him and says, let's divide the land into two. And let's go to the places where water is most likely to be because we need these animals. These are military animals. Okay, so when we look, when we look here, um, that uh, uh, we're got, let's divide the land uh, together. Um, and so we're up in verse five. Uh, maybe we can find some grass to keep the horses and mules alive um, so that they won't die. Horses were for battling. Mules for, were, were for carrying all the, they, they were the big tr supply trucks. They're for carrying all the supplies to the military. So here's Ahab, who's gone to, to Baal for help and protection. And instead, he's weak. His defenses are weak. He may not have horses to ride into battle. He may not have mules to carry their supplies with them. And so Ahab sits as unprotected in the land. The, Christ, the land is in crisis and unprotected. Um, and so he is being devoured. <laughs> um, but sin, uh, which Satan tempts us to do, harms us personally. If we go the route of Ahab. Um, so listen to God speaking again through Peter in, in 1 Peter. If you haven't picked up Peter's a book about how you behave in suffering. When you're suffering for your faith, here's, here's what you think about. But 1 Peter 2.11, Peter writes this. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world as citizens of heaven, with a, with a heavenly king. Therefore, you're an alien and a stranger in the world. Dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world to abstain from the sin, your sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Okay, our sinful desires are waging war against us, fighting against our well-being, fighting against your well-being. Satan is not your friend. He doesn't want anything good for you. He'll try to trick you uh, and uh, tempt you to do something out of God's will. And when you do that, it will harm you. And it may harm those who are around you. But in contrast to this, as we walk faithfully with God, he protects us. Okay, now a little stuff from Revelation here. So you read those passages there. Revelation 7, 1 through 4, in short, and you can go online and look at our Revelation Sunday School uh, there, go under teaching and Sunday school and then find the Revelation non-crazy style stuff and you can find this out in, in, the, in the Revelation 7. But this is God looking down upon the earth and, and all these tribulations are going to kind of come all over the world and, and the angels have been given authority to br bring this tribulation on the world. That's during Jesus' day through to our day now. Uh, but, but before this happens, there's one angel and he has the seal of God. And he says, wait until I've sealed all those um, who are God's own. 
And so yeah, where else do we see seal in the old in the New Testament? It's the seal of God's Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit seals us. That's Ephesians 1:13. And so we know there this, this group of this complete group of God's people symbolized there in the, the 144,000. There won't be 144,000 Jews who are saved. Um, there are already more than that who have been saved in the world in these 21 centuries since Jesus has been around. Uh, but but these once we're sealed with his Holy Spirit, we're protected by him. Ephesians 1.23, Jesus is watching out for us. He's protecting us. And while I can't see the seal of God's Spirit on, on Andrew or Charlene, God does. And those who are sealed with God's Spirit, again, Ephesians 1.3, those who are sealed with God's Spirit are protected. And whether earthquake or flood or war come and even should death come upon them they're protected protected eternally even if it's protection through death unto eternal life so that's revelation uh, 7 1 through 4 and, and these uh, passages uh, 12 6 and 13 and 14 um got this woman 12 uh, you know this, this uh, the 12 tribes are part of her. She gives birth to Jesus. Jesus goes up to heaven. This is a real fast version of Revelation 12 there. Jesus goes to heaven, and then Satan goes out to try to kill those who follow Jesus and obey his commands. But the woman is protected over and over again, even though Satan is making war against us. But we're being protected, whether it's by a safe place, a few images for us here in Revelation 12, whether it's being brought to a safe place where we'll, we'll be protected for time, times, and half a time during the entire tribulation time until Jesus comes back, or whether uh, the, 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 the flood of the current uh, gets swallowed up by a hole God creates for us. Those are uh, visual pictures for us to help us understand that no matter what's going on in the world, even if uh, we are dying a martyr's death, that we are being protected from the evil one during this time of 1260 days, 42 months, time times, and half a time, which is a, a, a hearkening back to this three and a half years of Elijah. So know that you'll be protected. And, and the message here is just be faithful. Satan's out to steal your blessing. Satan's out to take your, your good stuff and your well-being. And God is there to protect you and to provide for you. And we are faithful, knowing that he protects us he provides for us. He gives us bread and water when no one else has it. And he gives us a cave to hide in um, figuratively in our lives. Now, E, uh, to underline here, it's the devout, the devout, those in the church following Jesus who have God's provision and protection. Uh, that's what we're told about Obadiah. He was devout. And so be that. Be devout to the Lord. Know that your protection, your provision, your well-being in this life that you live here until you see Jesus face to face is, is, is through you being one of those who are devout, not one of those who have, have, have compromised their faith like uh, Ahab. Uh, but the devout, those in the church following Jesus, have God's provision and protection. And then F, so patiently endure in this life in being faithful. Patiently endure in this life in being faithful for God's care, his provision and protection are, are for his people. While those outside his people like Ahab and Jezebel are left exposed, exposed to foreign armies, no food and water. Uh, this is what Elijah, Obadiah and the hundred prophets do. They patiently endure this three and a half years, this time of tribulation. They remain faithful despite the troubles the world has brought them. So verses 1 and 2. Um, you see this here? Verses 1 and 2. Elijah hears the message to go to Ahab. Now, Ahab's seeking his life. Ahab's been hunting for him all over the place. And Elijah hears the word from the Lord, go to Ahab. So Ahab just, he just goes. He endures in his faithfulness, even if he has to come face to face with the one who's seeking his life. Um, you ever, you know, in those in movies and TV, you know, when the one guy who's trying to kill the other guy sees him and he doesn't just shoot him, he has to have this long conversation so that the guy he's trying to shoot escapes. <laughs> 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 but 
but Elijah goes to Ahab, and it could be as soon as they get in each other's presence that the soldiers come around to him and, and kill him. But Elijah patiently endures in his faith. God has, God has provided for me. He's protected me this three and a half years. Surely he will provide and protect for me in this exchange that I have with Ahab, who's seeking my life. Um, and then Obadiah has this challenge too. He's saying, if I go and say, Elijah's here, Ahab will kill me. But Obadiah, who's been faithful all this time, three and a half years, says, well, okay. He's protected me all this time and he'll protect me. He'll protect me now. Uh, and so those two remain faithful. Uh, Obadiah remains faithful during this time, protecting these prophets, knowing that if these prophets are found, that he will lose his life as well because he's been the one harboring uh, the, the prophets in these caves. So we have the, do the dominant exhortation of the book of Revelation. You know what that is? It's repeated over and over through Revelation. Patiently endure patiently endure. Now, what was going on when John was writing the book of Revelation? Um, the um, uh, Roman emperor at the time, uh, Domitian or Domitian, um, uh, starting around AD 91 through his death in AD, I think it's 96, is making everybody in his kingdom uh, bow down to him and declare him divine. Now, if you were a Jew, you were part of a licensed religion and you didn't have to do that because you're part of a licensed religion. But Christianity was not a licensed religion, thanks to the Jews who went to the who went to Domitian in the the uh, end of the 80s, um, and and you know the bad hair and the moose and all that stuff. The end of the 80s, mm -hmm. and, and they said these Christians are not a sect of the Jews, not a denomination, not a stripe of the Jews. They're a different religion, and so now Christians were not any more licensed religion people, and they were required to bow down before the emperor and declare him divine. And so people were losing their lives. And it's in this context that the book of Revelation is being written. And the, the exhortation of the book of Revelation is this, patiently endure. Those who die with the testimony of Jesus on their lips, their souls are in heaven around Jesus' throne right now. So patiently endure. Um, John, thir Revel or, sorry, Revelation 13, 19, John writes, he who has an ear, let him hear. If anyone is to go into captivity, into captivity he will go. Literally a, a Roman prison for his readers. If anyone is to be killed with the sword, with the sword he will be killed. This calls for patient endurance and faithfulness on the part of the saints. And that's the message for us. Whatever kind of tribulation that we are dealing with in our lives for our faith, God calls us to patiently endure even though it means our death. There's not better protection for us outside the kingdom of Christ. There's no better provision for us outside the kingdom of Christ. There's no better provision for us outside the Garden of Eden, in other words, by following the temptation of Satan. So we remain faithful, patiently, trudging through this life of tribulation because the goods Protection and provision are something God provides for those who are under the son of David, Jesus. So a summary for us this morning. Until Jesus returns, there will be tribulation or troubles. Um, same word is used and, and gets translated variously. Sometimes it's affliction. Sometimes it's troubles. Sometimes it's tribulation. But it's the same word by the biblical authors. Um, B. God will provide for and protect his people through these tribulations, through these troubles. And then C, to get through these troubles, this tribulation we're in and that the saints have been in uh, from the days of Abel and Cain, to get through this, these tribulations with faithfulness, you need the church for your encouragement. You need the church and you need patient endurance in your faith. You need the church and patient endurance in your faith. Let's pray.